Unemployed and Afraid acknowledges the traditional owners of the land we have recorded this episode on and of the land where you, the listener, are tuning in from. We would like to pay our respects to Elders past, present and extend our respect to any First Nations, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today, acknowledging that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Welcome to Unemployed and Afraid a podcast that explores the messy middle of being out on your own and starting over with the people who've done it. I'm your host, Kim Curtin. Thank you for being here. Let's get into today's story of starting over. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Unemployed and Afraid for an incredible story of starting over in work, career and business, all of the things. It still wigs me out that there are actual human beings listening to this podcast and quite a lot of you. So firstly, thank you for that. And getting messages from you sharing an insight into your world and how these stories are helping you feel more supported in your own journey is like literal magic for me. It was a message just like this that introduced me to my guest today. We cover so many topics that deeply resonate with me and hopefully you too, like unlocking the box of creation and creativity and not being able to close it again. What happens when you give your whole self to someone else's dream and your identity becomes merged with what you do? Taking risks and starting things when you have no idea how to get started and allowing your community to support you in all of the many micro steps and firsts along the way. There is just so much to take away from this story. And one thing you might take away from this story is me talking a little too closely into my mic in parts. So apologies if I'm a little bit loud here and there. We don't let perfect get in the way of done, right? Enjoy the app and don't forget to rate and review if you do. My guest today joins us with an incredible story to tell. Her name is Belinda Neem. She's a content creator, stylist and storyteller, the creator of Canberra Street Food Festival, The Forage and super host of Hold Cottage, the stunning accommodation, photo shoot and workshop space in Gunning, New South Wales that's been featured in Country Style magazine. But like so many of us, Belinda's story isn't all roses. Through the pandemic, she lost her dream job producing a beautiful publication and had to close both the street food festival and the cottage. Belinda is joining us in what I've referred to as her rebuild, and we all know that the comeback is much greater than the setback. Belinda, thank you for agreeing to share your story of starting over with me here today. Welcome to Unemployed and Afraid. Thank you, Kim. And I'm just so happy that I found you on Instagram and reached out. I'm really, really excited to be here. Oh, I'm so happy you found me too. The connections and the things that come into our world through Instagram just never cease to amaze me. Yeah, it's a pretty, pretty amazing space when it comes to building community. Yeah, I agree. So let's break the ice a little bit. Tell me, how would your kids describe you? (laughs) Oh, my kids. I think, let's start with a positive. I think they think that I'm fun, intense, really, really, really stubborn. But I hope that they think that I'm fiercely loyal and creative and hardworking. So, yeah, we have a very humorous Uh, relationship so I think fun is probably the top one I hope (laughs) well you'll have the opportunity to ask them once we uh, finish up recording they might even turn around go mum are you kidding you're dramatic you're intense (laughs) (laughs) anyway (laughs) so take me back in time a little bit so before all of the things that I mentioned in your intro who were you so I I was a stay-at-home mum but I waited to both the kids were at school before I returned to any type of work. When I had my first baby, I was a public servant and then I chose to stay home until I'd had both of them. And in that time, I realised that I didn't want to go back into that environment. My mind had got, I don't know, it was like a release and I really wanted to be in a creative space. So cut a very long story short, I was making cupcakes at home and I ended up starting to sell them down at the local farmer's market here in Canberra and they were extremely popular. And then two years later, I actually opened a cupcake shop called Cherry Seed and ran that for, what it was nearly eight years actually. And after the second lease came up to be re-signed, I decided that I'd ticked off all of my bucket list, I guess, within that business. And I really wanted a change and Yeah, so we eased out of there and then came the forage. So (laughs) that's sort of like where I was. The shop was amazing because I was able to have the kids there 
when they weren't at school, they were able to just come and run amok at the shop. <laughs> so it was a really great time for the family. It gave me flexibility, but hospitality is really hard work. So yeah. <laughs> I kind of was like, no, after eight years, I needed to get out of there. So yeah, that was pre-forage. And then from there, I ended up in my role at, in the magazine space. And yeah, that's where I've been, well, up until two and a half years ago. <laughs> The Cupcake Cafe just sounds like such a joyous place to spend time in. I imagine yeah. that was really fun at times as well. It was pretty amazing. It was in a historic village here in Canberra, which Canberra is not an old city by any means. So to have that space was really special because the buildings are old and it was on acreage. So the kids were able to run around. We ran kids parties that ended up being our main bread and butter, actually. Beautiful little kids parties. They got to decorate their cupcakes and we ran really traditional games outside. So yeah, it was a really beautiful place. And I met some amazing people who I'm still friends with now, even 10 years down the track. So yeah, it was good. But if anyone knows, hospitality is you don't really have a life outside of it. So I learnt a lot of not wanting to go into that again, but it, it suited our family at that time. You touched on something so interesting when you mentioned being a public servant and then taking the time off to have your children, that yeah. that creative aspect of your personality was was sparked there yeah. and you, you couldn't go back. I think that's something that a lot of people would relate to or have a feeling that that might happen to them too if they, they pause and, and step out of what they were doing. Tell me about that realisation that you had that creative energy inside you. I think because you're at home and look, the days are long when you're at home with two kids, toddlers and a baby, and you have more time than when, you know, you're full time. I find it hard to explain, but once I stepped, and because I was spending so much time with myself, with the kids at home, something just came to fruition and I just couldn't go back into that public service environment. I just found it so suffocating and I think being at home, it gave me that creative freedom. I could make my own decisions and do things that I really loved doing without having to go up through the hierarchy and come back down again. And I wanted the flexibility with the kids. And mum always said to me that the first five years go so fast, just give them your time. And yeah, so I think going back into an office job, just, uh, yeah, something really just did sort of like click. There's much to be said for a pause and a yeah. reset and, and that chance to listen to what's happening in your mind without the filling of the days with the meetings and the emails and the pings and the other people's to-do lists coming in. Yeah. You can just kind of get a little bit of clarity in there. Your priorities change too. Like I was no longer about climbing the ladder at work. My priority was now the kids. So to have that flexibility where I could fill a creative space for my own self but be there for the kids, be at every assembly, be at drop off and pick up. Everything switches, I think. Some people don't, but that's definitely where I found myself. So that's very interesting that you had this experience with an exciting foray into business with the Cupcake Cafe and then started to notice that that energy was, was waning in that space and you felt like you were being pulled to something else. Was that yeah. a scary decision to make, stepping away from the cafe? Oh, shocking. Absolutely shocking. I think because th the shop had become my identity. Like I was Belinda from Cherry Seed. I wasn't just Belinda. I wasn't Tilly and Fletcher's mum. I was wrapped by this space and I really struggled with letting that go because I was like, who am I going to be after this shop? What do I do? Um, but I knew it was right. I knew I'd done my time and I just couldn't give it anymore. It was a tricky place and, and not seeing the families every week and, and losing all of those connections, but I didn't lose my connections. So I think you just have to go through that process of letting it go and knowing that there is going to be something mm -hmm. after it, which is hard to see when you're in it. But yeah, definitely was a process. So take me through the something after the Forage Food Festival. When did that idea start to seed? Pardon the pun. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it had started probably 12 months before I closed the shop. My husband and I had been to Adelaide just for a trip away and we'd seen a bit of a street food movement starting to happen. We were running 
small events at the shop on Mother's Day and Father's Day. And we had a little old 1964 Sunliner caravan that we used to serve coffee out of and we'd put it out in the village just so we had more space. So we were creating these little events and then we went to Adelaide and got back and I just said to Tim, you know, Canberra hasn't got anything like that. I think I want to look at creating just a little laneway street food market at that point was probably where I was heading. So when I closed the shop, I reached out to a friend who had just started a fashion market and I just said to her, I have no clue (laughs) where to start, but I want to start a street food market. Just going off the success of our little Mother's Day and Father's Day events, I felt like I could do it. And yeah, and that friend was like, why don't you bring it to the fashion market and we'll do a collaboration. So yeah, away we went. We went and met with the people that owned the venue where she was running her fashion market. And I put in an application to do the food side of it. And yeah, that's where I guess it started. And I had no idea. In fact, (laughs) even when we were doing the first event, I just stood there and I thought, oh my God, I actually have not, I have zero clue what I'm doing right now. (laughs) I like, I just stood there in the middle of this laneway space. and was just like, I have no idea what I'm doing, but People came and I think at our first event we had close to 2,000 people just off the back of this idea and it was just an adrenaline-filled buzz and that's, yeah, that's kind of where it started. That's so cool, Belinda. I love that you said you just found someone in your network who was doing something in parallel, something similar, and just said, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I want to do this. It's amazing how many people you can find to help you when you find those words to say, can can you help me? Absolutely. Help me get started. Yeah, and I think, you know, my mum has always said, what's the worst they can say? And at the end of the day, if you don't reach out and if you don't ask, you can be no better off. So you may as well just put it out there. So I just thought, you know, Tegan's running this market. I'm just going to ask her, what do I do? How do I start it? Are there licenses that I need? And she was amazing. And just the collaboration was, was perfect. So to be able to cross promote and work off each other, it just really complemented. And it was the forage and hustle and scout for a long time. But yeah, it just came from just that little simple idea, I guess, spotting a bit of a gap in the market here in Canberra and just um, running with it. Mm, I love that name. You seem to have a bit of a, a knack for naming things beautifully <laughs> and memorably. So that's very cool. Tell me, how did the job producing the magazine come about and what was that experience like? That actually came from the shop. I met so many people through the shop and one of them was the owner of of this online media platform plus the magazine. And I actually, once I closed the shop, I actually put on Facebook that I was looking for part-time work and she reached out and said, I've got 10 hours a week. I know it's not a lot, but would you like to come and, yeah. So that's where that started. So I literally started on 10 hours a week and ended up pushing into full-time and I was there for five years. So that's, yeah. Good old social media. There's so much to be said for just putting stuff out there. We forget. I mean, sometimes I think, oh, I might need to help with this thing or this thing. And I'm like, oh, no, I'm too embarrassed to put that on that platform yeah. because somebody might be like, what is she asking that for? Or, exactly. you know, you exactly. worry so much about what people might think. But yeah. there's, there's a whole community. We all have these, these giant communities now absolutely. to be able to tap into. Yeah, absolutely. I think some of the best jobs are never advertised on seek.com or anything like that. So it's it's best to just put it out into your network and that's usually where the good stuff comes from. I just find that a lot of jobs aren't advertised through those formal platforms anyway, especially the line of work that I do. A lot of it comes from word of mouth. So yeah, put it out there. There's nothing to be ashamed of. You just never know what will come from it. So that's, that's how so I true. Land in there. Yeah. So we're building up quite a portfolio of your very cool creative outlets. And the other one that I want to touch on is the cottage. So how did that come into your world? I feel like I'm that person that just doesn't stick to one thing. You're just... and you're in the right place. Don't worry. Oh, I feel like sometimes I don't want to be. Yeah, it's it's hard. I think when you're creative, you just you just have all these ideas. Yeah. And, you know, some of them you shouldn't make happen. But anyway, the cottage I think's been a long term 
not as a holiday property, but my husband and I have always been drawn to the country, old country towns. We got married in the country. I had a horse growing up. I love being out in the country. So owning a country cottage was that little girl's dream. And Tim, my husband's very much into history. So it kind of fit. And we just started looking. We're looking for about 12 months purely for our own. We just wanted a a cottage in the country to go to for holidays and yeah we we couldn't find anything we were looking everywhere up in the snowies down high country of Victoria so we let it go for a little while and I spoke to a friend who's actually in car core and she just said to me just just leave it something will come up when it's right and yeah so I thought yep I'm just gonna leave it and then I don't know I was just sitting in front of the fire one night with my laptop and I I just said to Tim I might have a look in Gundaroo and Gunning and see what's there because it's only an hour from Canberra so it'll be more accessible if we were to rent it out and blah 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 anyway I opened up and I put in Gunning and this little red brick cottage just almost threw itself out at me in the screen and I just said to Tim oh my god you need to look at this and he took the laptop off me and he goes yeah it's all right and I'm like all right (laughs) all right are you kidding? I said, can you please text the real estate guy and tell him we want to look at it tomorrow? And he's like, okay, it's 9.30 at night, but sure. <laughs> so he did and we got a response straight away. So we went out the next morning and had a look and just as soon as we pulled up, we knew that little cottage was for us. And yeah, we went back and forth with a few offers and um, finally signed the contract. And yeah, Tim being the history person decided after we'd signed the contract, he's thought he'd have a look at the history of of the the cottage and couldn't believe it when I think he was on the National Library website and he knew that his family had immigrated to Gunning in the 1800s and he goes you're not going to believe this he said but Joseph Bean owned that block of land so that was his direct ancestors that actually owned oh. the cottage is sitting on no and way I said, are you joking he goes no they didn't the cottage is about 1910 so they'd passed away before that but Joseph Bean is all through the title blocks on the map in Gunning and one of them was our block so so bizarre and it was obviously very much meant to be and we just adore absolutely adore that little place and it I guess for me, it came at the very right time because I think we'd only had it eight months. We were still sort of renovating it. And yeah, it came at a time that was very challenging. So it's just weird how things just fall into place. It's a beautiful, beautiful space. And you can see your styling and just your ability to create something beautiful uh, very well within there. So we'll make sure to to get links up and and show the listener all about that. So This beautiful, interesting portfolio that you have of the Forage Food Festival as an event, it's an annual, was it an annual event that you had Uh, at that stage? Three times a year, basically autumn, winter, spring. Wow. So you have that and then you've got your work in the media space as well. And then you've got this accommodation that you've set up, this beautiful cottage that you're renting out onto Airbnb and creating a beautiful profile for. Yeah. Um, In comes 2020. So take me, take me there. (laughs) So yeah, in comes 2020. So basically when the first case of COVID hit Canberra, the next day I was actually made redundant from my position in the media space. So that came sudden, fast and unexpected to a certain point. That was in March. The forage was actually meant to be going ahead in the first weekend of April. So we had to pull that completely as well. And then obviously... I think by mid-April we had to close the door on the cottage too because there was, I mean, lockdown was a bit different in 2020. We were still sort of able to move around. So we were still able to access the cottage, but we couldn't rent it out. So, yeah, so there was a complete shutdown in my life. (laughs) And to a certain extent, I think I was so, when I look back at it now, I'm grateful that we were in lockdown. I was grateful to be able to, lock myself away and not be anywhere near the real world because it gave me time to grieve and just be alone because my sense of pride had been completely and utterly crushed and I just I just don't think I could have functioned outside of my four walls for a while so grateful for lockdown in that sense 
and was very grateful for that little cottage because it just gave me that place where I could breathe and just try and clear that fog. Mm. Yeah. Hearing hearing from you just now that the the first case had just hit your back door and the trauma associated with that, that was was shocking. It was shocking for for all of us. We didn't know what was coming next. To then the next day go into a conversation about a a redundancy for how you described at the time, a dream job. Yeah. Wow. That's a lot. (laughs) It was a lot. And I think for anyone that works in the private sector in small businesses knows that you're often in small teams. We were a very, very close-knit team. My boss referred to us as family. We were sisters. We told each other we loved each other every day. It was, we, yeah, it was a second family really. And to be the only one let go from there was just it was so brutal because the, the first thing that came to my well the first thing I said to my boss was is, is it only me and yeah and that was just a killer that I was the one that was selected I I understood why but how that was then handled after that was yeah it was really tough like it just crushed every ounce of my identity just yeah I felt abandoned you know I went from being someone's sister to not you know not even talking to me or like it just was yeah it was a really brutal time now that I look back at it I guess these things come to to teach us some lessons and I'm still unsure as to you know what that actual lesson is but it's given me some teachings going forward in the workspace Mm. yeah so Yeah. yeah that's 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 a lot and you mentioned the word identity there and and how much that I mean I just think it's so relatable for so many people to see a huge part of yourself through the work that you do be that for yourself or or somebody else and arguably I'd say when it's for somebody else it's a scarier place to be because that identity is not something that you essentially own so you mentioned before grieving and and it sounds so valid for that for that grief period to have happened yeah, I'm glad I had my own space to do the grieving because I really struggled. It just was a really, it was a horrible time. And I, I, I did a podcast with another podcast early on. It was only three weeks after being made redundant. And at that point, I think I was still in quite a lot of shock. And someone listened to that podcast and her name is Julie Gibbs. And she actually reached out to me via Instagram and said, Linda, I would love to talk to you. Can you give me a call? Now, Julie was a complete stranger but I rang her and she went through a very similar experience after working for someone for 20 years and um, she just said to me you know your job title does not validate who you are but at that point I was still very it was still very raw now I know how 100% right she was because it's just a job title it's not you it's not who you are it's not your skill sets it's not your talents it is just a job title and you can apply that anywhere to any job. But I just think because of the environment that, you know, the type of organisation it was, how close knit we were. Yeah, it just was, it was just a tough, tough time. Julie, what a legend she oh, is to reach is. out off the bat and just, yeah. you know, that's such a beautiful human thing to do to, to yeah. help make somebody else feel more seen. Like, Julie, oh, amazing. On you. <laughs> complete, complete stranger at that point. We followed each other because Julie had a holiday property up in the Blue Mountains too. But yeah, she reached out and just said, give me a call. And, and I didn't hesitate. And just to hear her story and know that, that the feelings were really normal, really helped, really helped yeah. me at that point. So never underestimate the impact that you can have on another human by reaching out that is that is yeah. just awesome. Yeah. Um, so your days then when you were going through that, how did they look? Uh, quiet I had my kids around well I had my kids around me just literally threw myself at just being with my immediate family with Tim and the kids and then I I think it was about a month after I was like nah I've got this cottage and I'm going to make something of it and I'm going to create this website and I'm going to just channel all my energies into this I need a distraction I need my creativity because the job that I was in was such a creative space. And when, as you would know, when you're creative, you have to fill that space. Otherwise there's a sense of like, I was really unsettled and you just want to do the things. So 
I was like, no, I'm not going to lay down. I'm just, I'm going to stick to myself because I felt safe at home, but I'm going to put everything I have into this cottage and I'm going to make this cottage work. And yeah, we launched the website and I think by June we were able to start taking bookings. So it probably, when I look back on it, it didn't deal with the redundancy. I chose to just push it aside and distract myself with the cottage. So if I had my time again, which God help me, if I would hate to think to ever be in that position again, but I would actually deal with it head on because it does affect you. It's still affecting me and I probably shouldn't have pushed it aside, but the cottage was sort of that crutch, I suppose, which I'm glad I actually did it because it did work for the cottage. <laughs> but it, yeah, for me, long term, I should have I should have dealt with it more head on. Yeah, I think a lot of people can can relate to that through that time in particular. But you mentioned something there about when you're you're in an environment where you're not tapping into the creative energy that you have. It's just sparked such an interesting thought for me, thinking right back to before I allowed myself to tap into my different types of creativity and and how they they come into play. I had that feeling of restlessness, of frustration, of I just need something, you know, almost like my legs are are wiggly and my brain is annoyed and I just, I could never figure out exactly what it was. And I think the way that you describe just that your creativity just needs a place to channel itself is such an acknowledgement of that. So, you know, I think hopefully there are others that can relate to that feeling and know that even if you don't have the outlet yet, you know, if you're not a a painter or a maker or a stylist, if you've got that sort of energy just to start creating something. Exactly, exactly. And you will always, I think when you're creative, you'll always find something that, that the passion is there. So it's just a matter of finding it. And even if it takes a few times, you know, you might dabble in four or five different creative spaces until you find what really makes your heart full. That's just part part of the process of being a creative. (laughs) And usually at the same time. (laughs) And it's overwhelming. It's hard to be a creative. (laughs) I was just talking to my parents on the phone earlier this morning and, and I was just telling them about a few ideas I had and they're like, can you just leave like one small crack of space without a thing no. in it? So I'm like, no, because, but, but, but what about this? I, I feel know. like this is fun. Exactly. <laughs> because I think I'm getting better at, you know, when you, when you've got a creative mind, the ideas are constant. And I think since my redundancy, I've started writing those ideas down instead of executing them. That's good advice. <laughs> yeah. You need I can to, take that. Yeah. You need to write them down and see, sit on them for a little while because you could be channeling your energy into something that yes it's an idea but it's actually not going to be a great idea so I've just started writing stuff down and if there's you know two or three that really niggle away and really sit and I just know that you know in my gut they're good I will execute them but yeah write them down get them out of your head (laughs) and and then cross them off as you go because it is overwhelming yeah, you're exactly right. And I imagine your days now, you know, we are we are coming into that, I guess that rebuild phase. You're well and truly in there now, yeah. you know, a year or so down the line and, and starting to to look at different different things and different opportunities. Where are you at now? I'm in a bit of a funny place. The cottage was full time for me from basically well, in between all the lockdowns. So busy, so so busy. We got the feature in country style. We were just back to back with Bookings, I mean, that was largely due to the fact that you couldn't go anywhere but within your border. So we were really, really flat out. This year's been a different space. We're in a different environment now with interest rates going up. There's a lot Mm -hmm. of uncertainty around the economy. So things really have quietened down. Borders opened. I think the the sense of being trapped and just getting away for for a weekend is, is no longer there. So, yeah, things were really, really quiet. So... We obviously had to, you know, being a creative is great, but you still have to pay bills. So (laughs) I'm just being, we had to be realistic and with the cottage quietening down, I needed to find work outside of, outside of that to pay bills and really to, I guess, recover from my redundancy and, and get back in there and find that confidence again. I was terrified of showing my face in the city I was terrified of 
questions from my network. I was embarrassed. So there was all of that, you know, but reality was the business has quietened down and I just need to go to work (laughs) for now. So again, I put a call out on social media and said I was looking for part-time work. That would fit around my business. I was very adamant that I wanted to keep things going. I have landed myself an amazing job as an event manager at Craft ACT and Design Centre that produce a big festival across three weeks in November. So I'm back in the city. (laughs) I'm back. I've seen a few people that I haven't seen since my redundancy. It's been tough because my personal network sort of crosses over into my job Mm -hmm. in that space. So it's hard, you know, when people ask about it and I, I don't, you know, I'm very professional with how I approach talking about it. So yeah, I just had to get all those firsts out of the way. So I'm back working two days a week in, in that space, still running the cottage. The cottage is really busy on weekends, which is great. We've just slowed right down on those midweek bookings, mm-hmm. but that works perfectly because I'm in the city doing my event management job during the week. And yeah, it's still a weird weird space but I started at Craft ACT in beginning of June so it's still Mm -hmm. very fresh but yeah really lovely lovely team and exciting space I'm surrounded by creatives I'm surrounded by you know the art world which is right up my alley with ceramic artists and jewelry makers and all of that so I I feel so grateful of where I am is it where I want to be for how long I don't know I'm just doing it and just doing the things and very grateful. I'm quite stuck on something you said, which I just think warrants coming back to once you got over all of the firsts. I think Mm. that can feel like such a ginormous mountain to scale, just even taking the phone out and thinking, okay, I'm going to write some stuff here. I'm going to be vulnerable. I'm going to ask my network to think of me again after this challenging period of being made redundant and and not wanting to face perhaps any of this network or think about this space. That alone would have been very scary, I imagine, and something to, to scale. Yeah, very scary. And I guess to a certain point, I had avoided it for two years. I made a purpose of not going into the city in Canberra. I literally was going from my home out to Gunning to the cottage and back. I would go to the basketball stadium to watch my daughter play basketball. That was pretty much the extent of it. I really have locked myself away, whether it was a coping mechanism or whether it was just pure avoidance. I think maybe it was a combination of both. At the beginning of this year, the forage came back after two years and we ran it in collaboration. Oh, fantastic. With Enlighten, which is a massive festival here in Canberra, it's the light displays on our iconic buildings. And they reached out to me at the end of last year and said, would, would I be interested? And oh, it took, you know, I just knew that I would have to step into that space again within Canberra. Mm. And I didn't know if I was ready, but when are you ever ready? And I just had to do it. I literally said to myself, you don't have a choice because you could keep going like this for the next five years. <laughs> and, and you know what, you work damn hard on that event and I'm going to bring it back. And every little step was hard. Afterwards, it was just like a big sigh of relief. And that sort of stepped me back into the network space, especially in the food and hospitality industry. And they were the start of my first, I guess. And yeah, it's just been gradual from there. Again, I probably could have done it better, but I've just had to take my time and just roll with the emotions instead of pretending they're not there. Just acknowledge them. And if I'm having a bad day, I'm having a bad day. I'm Mm. having a great day. I'm having a great day. So there's no shame in any of it. But yeah, tough place. (laughs) Canberra is very small, very tight knit city, which is amazing. And that's the only reason the forage has got to where it has got to because the ability of Canberrans to network and collaborate and cross promote is Mm. phenomenal here. It's like nothing I've seen in other cities. It's a really amazing place and culture. But yeah, when that gets stripped from you, it's hard. It's all at the back of your head. Are they talking about me? What do they know? What do they know of the situation? Do they know the truth? So yeah, it's been a journey. (laughs) But I'm very grateful that everyone has been amazing. And they're just, you know, to have the forage come back the way it did just gave me that real sense of, yeah, I felt really proud, one, to get back up and two, 
to just just know that you know that everyone's still there and it doesn't matter that I'm no longer Belinda from blah blah it didn't matter they were all all only interested in me so Mm -hmm. (laughs) not my job title yeah and it's funny how that happens so when you realize oh hang on a minute actually no I I am not the role I'm not the job I'm not the place I am so much more and you most certainly are and always will be and it's so great to hear you say that you are taking steps and the steps are the thing to the next steps and you just keep going it's not necessarily the be all and end all be it the part-time job you have now the thing that you're probably going to create in two weeks time when you have a spark of an idea or the thing that will come (laughs) 10 years after that it's it's all just learning Learnings and a journey and it doesn't need to be all perfectly mapped out and in my opinion you've done an incredible job so congratulations to, to all you. that you've you've gone through and I'm interested how have you changed through this process I'm not overly proud of the way I've changed because I'm naturally a very fiercely loyal person and very trusting I think too to a certain point I was very selfless. I constantly gave to others. The changes that have come with with what happened to me personally, my trust levels are really like it's like I've got little radars on everywhere. So my trust, I think that'll take time to build back up. To a certain degree, I have actually become a little bit selfish. I really did put myself first for a good couple of years and I was like I gave everything to that job and it can just go like that and I just thought you know I gave everything to someone else's dream I'm not doing that again I'm giving it all to my own dream and yeah so they're not things that I'm overly proud of but I guess it's come from the circumstances but the good things I've learned the difference between a professional and a personal relationship and where that where the boundaries need to lie it's definitely made me I don't know if stronger is the right word what would be the word it's not stronger it's given me the confidence that I can get through challenging times and I don't love what it has done to me in a certain it just doesn't feel natural but it, it is a guard up at the moment mm-hmm. because it is still quite raw So I think, you know, now that I'm back working in a team environment and they've been so great, hopefully that that trust stuff will come back and I can use all the negative stuff and turn it into the positives in my workplace. One thing hasn't changed is I'm a really hard worker and I always will be no matter what. So I'll always give my job 150%. And I'm glad that part of me hasn't changed. So yeah quite a few changes positive negative I hope they all end up being positive and just know going forward where my boundaries are what do you think is next for you I hope as little as possible (laughs) (laughs) um the the cottage is a long-term thing I really feel like I've landed where they need to be when it comes to the cottage I love hosting guests I that little cottage just has this incredible ability to I don't know it's such an incredible space. So I'd like to keep building on that. There's things we want to do out there that will enable us to grow it as a brand and the experiences that come with it. The forage, that's something that will definitely keep going. There's just a few roadblocks at the moment, but that's okay. And with my new position, who knows? And that's what everyone's been saying to me. You don't know what will come from this. At the moment, I'm really happy with the balance. I don't want to get back to where I was doing three big projects at once I just I couldn't be present enough and like with everyone COVID's sort of given us that insight into actually I don't want that rushed life and be a creative that's hard because you are rushing all the time in your head so yeah I think look those three things at the moment the cottage will be long term and we'll just see where the rest plays out I just I don't want to have a plan because plans just never work out. There's some saying I'll, I'll get wrong, but you know, life happens when you're making your plan for something else exactly. or yeah, <laughs> something, exactly. something in that. No, I completely agree with you. Linda, you've been so generous in sharing your story, your experience today and an insight into major disruptive change and rebuilds and, and going back. And thank you for that. It's, it's been really wonderful to hear your story. Right. Is there something that the listener and I can do to support you on your journey? Oh, look, I would love to say just follow me on social media, but we all know where social media is at right now. And Yeah, it's having um, a time, isn't it? Oh, 
Gosh. So yeah, I mean, I would love for everyone to to follow us at Hold Cottage and the Forage if if you'd like to. I'd also love for people to sign up for our newsletter on Hold Cottage and you can do that just via the website, which is holdcottage.com and just fill up, fill out the little pop-up box. And we just do a monthly newsletter with a recipe, what's going on in the region, workshops that might be coming up, just really slow reading. I don't fill your inbox every two days or whatever. So I would <laughs> love that. Yeah. And Please, if anyone, you know, wants to, my personal page is there as well. And if anyone's been through a similar experience, I would love to talk. Because as I said to you, Kim, earlier on, redundancy is a very lonely space. So, you know, and I think your podcast is, well, it has helped me so much because hearing people's story puts normality around it. So, yeah, if anyone wants to reach out, I'd love to chat because it can be very, very lonely and it's a big thing. That's so generous of you. And again, your story and sharing so much has just been so wonderful. I'm so grateful you came on to, to chat with me today. So no, thank you. I'm grateful for you doing this podcast, Kim, because I know the time that would go into it. And yeah, it's very much appreciated. Oh, thank you. It's my pleasure. It's, yeah, I hear you. These, these creative passions, they do, they take time and headspace and energy, but you just can't not, can you? Like, you just, <laughs> you just got to, <laughs> yeah, I need to write a list. Yeah, but the problem is I'll stick it on a wall and then I'll put all the sub lists underneath it and then I'll just stare at it all day. <laughs> That's all right. And then be brutal, cross them yeah. out, cross them out. <laughs> That's excellent advice. I'm going to definitely take that one on board. Thank you for spending time with me today. It's been such a pleasure to have you. Thanks so much, Kim. Thank you for listening to Unemployed and Afraid, the stories of starting over with your host, me, Kim Curtin. If you liked the episode and are keen to hear more, please hit the follow button and leave a review. And let's keep the conversation going on Instagram at Unemployed and Afraid, where there's more goodies and links to today's show notes. See you there.